morning. Welcome to our service here at St. John's. It's lovely to have you with us for the second uh, of the four Advent services. A particularly warm welcome to you if you're a visitor or if you're here for the first time. Always great to get to know new folks, so do come and say hello uh, to Tom or myself. Uh, later on, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, uh, at which Tom will be presiding. We've much to enjoy this morning, much to share together, so we're going to get straight into it uh, with the, uh, do pick up your service sheets. I've, one thing I should have mentioned, and I do apologise, because it's extremely important. Please do, as you know, we're, we are very concerned about COVID at the moment. Please do read the uh, information on your service sheets about COVID. We are keen uh, to keep safe and to keep each other safe, so please do read that notice in relation to masks, and hand washing, both now and it also, of course, is relevant uh, in the work hall afterwards. We have coffee in the work hall. Please do join us for that. So, as I say, let's get straight into it. Second Sunday of Advent, I get to light two candles this week if I can manage the matches. A word or two about Advent. The lighting of Advent candles depicts the growing expectation we have for the coming of Christ, the light of the world. The main symbolism portrayed by the wreath is the growing intensity of the light <coughs> uh, of the candle lighting, including each Sunday an additional candle until on Christmas Day, the one in the middle is uh, ignited. And that is the anticipation for the building celebration in a sense for Christmas, but ultimately for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Advent. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Shall we say together, we light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Just give me a moment. Getting that right has been the uh, preoccupation of my week, it's impressive what you've done. I will lead the blind by a road they do not know, by the paths they have not known I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. Come, Lord Jesus our light, and our salvation. Lord God of Israel, with expectant hearts, we, your people, await Christ's coming. As once he came in humility, so now he comes in glory, that he may make all things perfect in your everlasting kingdom. For he is Lord forever and ever. Shall we then, with expectant and glad hearts, stand and sing together this wonderful first hymn? And come, and come.
Please do be seated. In a moment, I'll say collect, which is the prayer dedicated for uh, today. But before I say that prayer, shall we all say together uh, the words on the service sheet? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, unworthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, raise up, we pray, your power, and come among us, and with great might succor us, that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are grievously hindered in running the race that is set before us, your bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let me uh, add uh, my welcome to Peter's. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Great to be here together as uh, God's people and uh, to share in the Lord's Supper together. Just a couple of notices. The first is that you'll see that there's... Um, we don't usually have a sort of a silver shroud behind me. Uh, that's uh, part of the set for this afternoon's Advent service uh, with children. There's a, there's a trail uh, that's happening through town and then there's a cafe and then we have a service at four o'clock with Donkey. So um, you'll be very welcome to join us and uh, do pray for that if you're not able to join us uh, for the number of people that are coming uh, with us. Uh, and uh, then let me also highlight that next week is our civic carol service. That's at 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, a number of um, people from the town will be here. And again, it's a great uh, opportunity for us to support that and to mix and to be amongst them. Uh, and uh, it would be great to better sing carols uh, together and to hear from God's word together. There's a number of Christmas cards out on the um, shelves out uh, in the porch as well. Uh, they need to be delivered to particular locations. They tell you where they need to be delivered. And if you fancy um, going for a wander around the parish at some point this week and um, uh, just dropping a few uh, Christmas cards through, uh, that would be a really helpful and great thing um, to do. As uh, Peter said, uh, we've got some um, tea and coffee over in the Warwick Hall afterwards. Just make your way out across the churchyard and uh, tea and coffee to warm you up. Uh, although it's not feeling too cold in here today. Uh, so it's, uh, but uh, let me encourage you to uh, stay afterwards. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video, and uh, one of the joys of actually having screens and projectors now is that we can watch a video, and it's a video, uh, it's a spoken word, where uh, uh, someone is sort of and explaining what it might feel like to be like Joseph, and to receive the news that Joseph had, uh, that uh, Mary was pregnant. So we're going to watch that, and uh, hopefully it will all make sense as we come to the reading, and then, um, uh, then uh, following the reading we'll also uh, look at the passage together. But after this video, the band will come and lead us in our next song together. Like I said, it's powerful. Uh, and, uh, well, let, let, let the uh, it's, I'll give it another go. But um, it's a spoken word rather than a silent word. <laughs> but, uh, technology's great. Love it. I don't want to hear it. All right, let's just. Oh, one click too far. Oh. 
how could this happen? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just speechless. If we were getting married, I thought God was with us. Every time she speaks, I guess she was from my born. I feel so betrayed. I feel so alone. I don't believe it. I just, I just can't. Because if it means what I think it does, she's broken my heart. And she won't, she won't stop with the half-truths and the lies. Of course she's played away from home. Either that or she's putting away the pies. I can't believe she did this. She's got barely three months gone. And, and what's more, she's got the nerve to say, I've got it all wrong. <laughs> wrong? Oh, hang on. So you're talking about the opposite of right? you got a baby bump shown through your clothes and now we're too tight. How could you do this? We made a vow not to go there till the wedding night. It breaks my heart. She's left me for another guy. But what makes it worse is her obsession to lie. I don't want your excuses. It's still deceit. At least give me the decency of admitting you're a cheat. She tells a story. Listen, Joe, an angel appeared. Is she taking a mick or just being weird? Joe, I'm with child, a boy, a son. You know there's an heir to David Strong, she says. Well, he's the one. So, so you're giving birth to God's chosen son. This bun in your oven, then, he's the one, as in the one who will reign for all the time. <laughs> Mary, if you had too much wine, look, just, just save it, all right? You made your bed, so lie in it. Oh, hang on, you already did, and there was someone else there with you in it. And that's when I stormed off and made my exit. Why did she do this? I don't need this grief. I don't want a divorce, but it's the only course left for me. The wedding's off. She's had an affair. You don't believe me, the proof's right there. But although it's fair, I won't make it public. I won't cause a scene. Then later that night, I had this dream. An angel turned up, said, Mary's record's clean. Don't cancel the wedding, don't freak out. It was through God's Holy Spirit this miracle came about. So his story checks out. After all this time, now I know she didn't cheat because God's given me the sign. My heart skips a beat, I can't take this in. The angel says call him Jesus because he'll save people from this sin. I asked the angel in my vision, What's my role? What's my mission? The angel said, I'm glad you asked. Marry Mary. That's a task. So then I woke up and did what he said. And a bit later on, Mary and I wed. Some months later, Jesus arrived. There were wise men with gifts and shepherds at his side. I was dad on earth, and, and he was my boy, and, and God was his father, who he also brought joy. And when I remember his humble birth, the penny drops of why he came to this earth. I don't believe it, I just, I just can't. Because if it means what I think it does, he's God incarnate. The embodiment of God in skin and bone. My stepson will live amongst us, so we'll never be alone. And here's a point I need to tell. Jesus' name is also Emmanuel. That's good news, you can trust, because his name means God is with us.
you see this? If you want us to hear just now that the donkey's back, by popular demand this afternoon, he's, I know from previous years, very much the professional. I think I'm right, he actually has his own agent. So that will be a treat. Uh, before Paul comes and reads for us, I'm going to read a verse from Psalm 25 to help us prepare ourselves to hear the reading of the word of the Lord. Make known to us your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the Lord God of our salvation. For you we will wait all day long. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter, and beginning at the 18th verse. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. And he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Familiar words, but let us pray as we come to them that God might speak to us. Gracious God, we thank you for giving us the scriptures. Please, uh, we ask would uh, they come afresh to us by the power of your Spirit, working through them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we live in, I suppose, uncertain times. That is, that we need one more letter of the Greek alphabet, and we find ourselves panicking about COVID and what next week might possibly bring. But of course, that's not the only thing that gives us uncertainty. It could be um, uh, our economic situation, it could be your job situation. It could be the fact that MI6 told us that China is our greatest threat. Our world is uncertain. And of course, it was only a month or so ago that COP26 met uh, to talk about climate change and global warming. Will there be a world for us to live in, uh, in, in our generation or even the generations to come? And it does all feel a little bit crazy. And, uh, and so often people say, and these are unprecedented times that we're living in. Uh, but I want to say that I'm not sure they're quite as unprecedented as we think. Life has always been uncertain. We can kid ourselves to think that um, maybe life was easier and more straightforward. And I suppose it has been at different times. But in reality, at any moment, we can find ourselves living with great uncertainty, not really sure what tomorrow will br really bring. COVID, I suppose, has in somewhat highlighted it to us. As I think of Joseph that we had in our reading from Matthew 1, living in a hostile world. I mean, his king, I mean, whatever you think of your politics, um, Herod is his king. And Herod is, to put it nicely, crazy. I mean, he kills children because he thinks that possibly they might come up and rise up against him. And Joseph, in his personal life, finds his circumstances totally rocked. The girl that he was pledged to be married to, and that, that marriage is far more, that sort of, it's far more than our engagement. In, in verse 19, Joseph is described 
as her husband, it, it is, I suppose, as good as done, she's pregnant. And it definitely wasn't him. The girl that he thought he was going to have a future with, a, a family with, is now pregnant. And throughout all of history, that has always involved another man. It is not unreasonable to assume that she has been unfaithful. His world has come crashing down. But it is into that situation that God comes. Uh, God comes, and rarely does he come like this, but he does. He sends his angel in a dream, and he says, that problem that you think you have, well, it's all part of my plan. It's all part of my plans to bless the world, Joseph. You don't need to have your world rocked by this. I am still in charge. And what will give Joseph this assurance? And what does God think will give us assurance this morning? Well, it is an old and forgotten promise that comes in Isaiah 7. Because Matthew takes us right back there to Isaiah 7, which you can find on page 691 if you'd like to follow. Because this is a similar world of uncertainty. We're talking some 264,000 days before the first Christmas. If you thought your countdown calendar was, uh, or your children or grandchildren got a bit mad, here we go, it's 264,000 days before Christmas. And they are living in a bleak future. Uh, Judah uh, have great concerns because they are going to be facing a great battle. It, it might help with a bit of Bible history at this point. That is that after King Solomon, God's people were split in two halves. Not equal halves. If your brother cut the, the, um, sort of the, the brownie like that, you definitely want the bigger half. Uh, you've got ten tribes who remain being called Israel, but separate themselves from David's king. They, they make themselves a new kingly line and a new capital city. And then you have two tribes uh, in the south that keep David's king on the throne. And what we have here is uh, the promise of God's king would always be in David's line. So you have Israel have split off from God's promise. And they are clubbing up with a group of people called Aram. Again, another nation. And they have made a pact together, we see in Isaiah 7, uh, against Judah, God's people. But it's not just, therefore, against Judah, but against God and his promises. Chapter 7, verse 2, Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. The threat was real. But, it says in verse 7, it will not take place. It will not happen. It's a real threat, but in God's eyes, it's insignificant. And by verse 16 of chapter 7, we're told that the land will be laid waste. That actually, they don't need to worry that, that actually these, this northern kingdom and, um, and Aram will, will be laid waste. And God says in verse 8 and 9, it won't happen because the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is only Rezin. It's only King Rezin. Don't worry about it. He's only a man. And in verse 9, the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son or, or King Pekka. Don't worry about him. It's not important. Only them. And so he says, verse 9, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. That's right. There are two sides. You can stand, stand firm in your faith, and you'll stand. Well, you could not stand firm in your faith, and you won't stand. And so God says to King Ahaz, through his prophet Isaiah, ask me for a sign. And I think what you have here is, is a very unusual situation, because King Ahaz is a dreadful king. He is a king who does not love God at all, has never listened to God uh, in any shape or form as far we, as we can ever tell. And it's as if God is saying, I so love my people, I so want them to know that they will be safe, that they will be protected, that Ahaz, you can genuinely ask me for anything, and I'll do it for you. And Ahaz says, I will not put the Lord to the test. It's amazing how badly you can handle the Bible. <laughs> because he is, he is right, we shouldn't ever put the Lord to the test. 
And that is, we shouldn't say to God, and, you know, I will only trust you if you do this. We should just trust him. But God says, ask me for anything. He offers him absolutely anything and says, look, look, trust me, listen to me. I will do anything to prove that you will be okay. It was a, an act of grace on God's behalf uh, on, on, to God, to, um, to Ahaz. But Ahaz is a real problem king. He's in the line of David, but not godly. He sounds religious, but he has no faith or trust. And so he refuses. He says, I do not want the sign." I'll sort it all out myself. That is what he does, is that he agrees to, uh, rather than trust God, he says, do you know what, I'll, I'll ring up the local superpower, Assyria, and I'll club on with them. Because, of course, that's a very practical and sensible solution. You've got a little army, there are two bigger armies coming to get you, so you get a bigger army, and you bring them in. It's a very sensible solution. So I'll handle it, he says. But God gives him a sign anyway. Verse 14, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Emmanuel. And as verse 16 goes on to say, before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. That is, the sign really is an opportunity for them to demonstrate faith, because it's actually only useful after the events have taken place. That is, the boy probably appears in chapter 8, not of a virgin birth, but to a young woman, a young maiden. And it's the same word, young maiden and virgin. In some sense, what it gets is a time scale. Isaiah says that before a young woman can get pregnant, have a child, and before the child knows the difference between right and wrong, this lot will be gone. Don't worry about it. They'll be scattered and so in two, three, four years' time, you'll look back and go, do you remember those? Do you remember when Israel came to attack us? And, and Aram, they, they clubbed together, and we're all afraid. Do you remember? They, they've gone, haven't they? And, and we were told that actually by the time a woman got pregnant and given birth and kind of the child had got old enough, then they'd be, God was with us, Emmanuel. It kind of all makes sense. God does rescue. He was with them. Now, I do think we love the idea of God watching over us, God being with us. But there are two sides to God's presence with us. If we're firm in faith, then we'll stand. But God is with us if we're not firm in faith. Because, as verse 17 predicts, the Assyrians come and they get Judah too. They are up to their neck in them. They don't quite drown. They do survive. But they are judged. And this is the other aspect of Emmanuel, of God with us. If we do not stand firm in faith, we will not stand. You see, God with us is not just some sort of nice, warm, comfort blanket, the idea that he's sort of, you know, walk alongside us and if a bus comes along, he'll push us out the way. Now, he is near, but he therefore knows our belief or lack of it. Think of how the idea of the allies are with us would be heard on D-Day. If you were French on the beaches... The allies are with us is good news. If you're in Berlin, you know the end is nigh. And therefore, God is with us. So take all of that and go back to Matthew chapter 1 and think of what um, Joseph is told. Joseph is told that um, Mary is indeed pregnant, it's by the Holy Spirit, and you're to give him the name Jesus because God will save. And all this fulfills to say that God was with us, Emmanuel. God's people living under hostile king, under the threat and reign of Rome, not free and longing that the promise that God had made might be true. They were waiting for that king. And it is into that situation that the angel says, here is Jesus, here is God's salvation. Here is Emmanuel, God with us. But this time, it is a virgin that gives birth. It is the sign that is fulfilled in its fullest sense. A greater sign for a greater work, because the rescue is now no longer just military rescue, but spiritual rescue. 
rescue from sin, the great barrier that separates us from God, the barrier that means we can't be with God, the barrier that ultimately means that the world is in the state that it's in, that we have all the uncertainty we have. And take that into Joseph's personal circumstances, a world uncertain and made more uncertain by his fiancée's pregnancy. But, but Joseph, your plan to divorce her is therefore not necessary anymore. The child will bring rescue to the world because he is God with us. And again, it's a sign that Joseph has to take at face value and needs faith because he'll only know if it's really true if this child saves. And so on the cross of that first Easter, we see how he provides that great rescue. On the cross, Jesus takes the penalty for sin so that we can be forgiven. He rescues people, not just from the symptoms of the uncertainty of this world, not just the war or the injustice or the sickness, but its very root cause from the sin that separates us from God. And so from that first Easter, we can look back at the death and then at the resurrection of Jesus. And as we look back at it, as we see God's saving work, we can say, God is with us. Emmanuel. He truly came. I want us to notice the two possible responses. You have Ahaz, King Ahaz, and in the uncertainty and fear. What does he do? He hears the promise of God. He hears the promise of God's rescue. And he does the practical, logical, and sensible thing. One army versus two armies. Well, let's get a bigger army. Defeat it. He hears the promise of God's presence and rescue, ignores it, and the consequence is judgment. Joseph, in his uncertainty and fear, will he do the practical, sensible, and logical thing and put Mary aside, go back to the drawing board, start afresh with someone who hasn't been unfaithful? Do the practical and logical thing. After all, she's pregnant and he wasn't involved. But faced with the practical, logical, and rational thing, he hears the promise of God's presence and rescue. And then we read in verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. You see, he didn't do the sensible thing. The logical thing. He did the thing that required faith and trust. He trusted in the promise of God. And the promise of God were, were far bigger than his own circumstances. God was doing something massive here, massive in the world, restoring the whole world. God was coming near. And that's a challenge to us all, is it not? To have faith like that, to trust. Well, I think we love the idea of God being with us, alongside us, helping us. But the God who is with us is the God who is only with us as he saves us. Of course, that's a wonderful thing. If, if your house is on fire, the fireman is who you want to see. But often we live our lives thinking we can live them without God, that we don't need saving, we don't need rescuing. We hear God's offer to come near, but we don't want him to save us. Because we don't like that idea, the idea that we might need any help or assistance from God. We can do things our own way. We often behave like Ahaz. We are in need, but we often try and succeed by fixing things ourselves. We hear God's offer to come near, to save, and we say no. I think it's why Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. Because with our wealth, we can fix a number of things. You could replace that with things like it's harder for an educated person to get into the kingdom of heaven because we can use our brains or our wisdom. We, we can come up with all sorts of things that we try and do rather than receive the forgiveness and the rescue from God. We rely on our wallet and our wisdom. Instead, we need to see how Joseph's response is the right one. We need to hear the need that we have, receive God's presence with us, and follow his lead. And so God comes to us. That first Christmas, he is God with us. 
So if the sign of Emmanuel called on God's people to have faith in Isaiah's day, the call is the same today, to have faith and trust in him. And God draws near to all. He invites each of us to respond to him. And suppose the question is that in all the difficulties, all the challenges of life, where is it that we're going to find our hope? Where is it that we'll find our trust? Will we sort it out ourselves? Or will we trust in him? Because, of course, one day we'll come across something that we can't fix. We've tried. We've tried everything to avoid death. But it will one day come. What will get us through? Where will our trust and hope be then? And so we need to trust and rely in Emmanuel, God with us, the God who comes to save. In the new year, we're going to be offering a course called Hope Explored, which is an opportunity for each of us to explore that hope that God offers each of us. Because knowing that in him, that God is with us, in all the mess, the uncertainty of life, there is a promised and certain future. But it is through faith in Jesus Christ, through his saving, because it is as he saves that we know truly that God is with us. Let me pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, you came to save, and that as you came to save, you draw near us. And so in all the circumstances, the uncertainty of life that we face, we ask that you might help us to find our faith and trust securely found in you. Strengthen our faith in you, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll stand and sing.
Please do be seated. In a moment, Gaynor is going to come and lead us in prayers, but before we do, we're going to say the creed. Do you ever wonder why we say the creed? We don't want to just say stuff because it's here in the service. Lots of good reasons. Surely one reason is that we are encouraging ourselves and one another and our belief when we state the truth and doubt comes to us all and the creeds are a wonderful tonic. So should we stand together and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's pray. <clears throat> One Chronicles tells us, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And indeed, we do thank you, our Father, especially at this Advent time, for the great plan of salvation that brought the Lord Jesus to this earth. We pray that throughout this period, we will prepare our hearts to see the real joy of Christmas and to share it with others. We pray for the witness of our church through various events that will take place, especially for the Advent family fun that will take place this afternoon. May it bring many opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those who come. We pray for the Advent trail through the town and ask that it may be a good witness to those out and about in Burford. We pray too for all the carol services that will take place here in the benefice. Imbue them with your Holy Spirit and let the true meaning of Christmas be central in the messages of the sung carols and spoken word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the wider, uncertain world this morning, especially for the places suffering from natu natural disasters. We pray for those still without power in the north of England. We pray for those suffering from drought in Africa, for those in the midst of famine in Yemen and Afghanistan. Lord, move the hearts of your people to help. And may your mercy rest upon those without any other hope. We ask too that in your mercy you will bring about a diminution of this virus and help all those who are suffering from its consequences through mental problems, loss of occupation, delayed treatments and ill health caused by the virus itself. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Today we pray for generosity to those who are less fortunate than ourselves. And thank you that we as a church can continue to support Besom and CAP when there are so many people in need at this time of year. We pray for those in both organisations who are visiting homes where there is often despair. May they bring hope where there is none and protect them from any evil that may befall them. Thank you, Lord, for these people who so willingly share their time and effort and help us to feel moved to do the same. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for those who are sick in our benefice. 
bring comfort to the lonely and confused, ease to those in pain, and peace to the anxious. In a moment of quiet, let us name one person who is in need of our Lord's healing power at the moment, and I'm sure we are aware of many of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So as we go out into this Advent season, help us not only to worship the baby in the manger, but to praise you as King of kings and Lord of lords, who came down to earth to redeem us because of your great love for us. Amen. we come to this time of communion we uh, come with knowing that uh, our repentance brings God great joy and our saviour great joy as that is why he came to come and to give his life to rescue us and to restore us and therefore as we come to him in humility and seek his forgiveness we come knowing that he receives us and we are welcome so you that truly and earnestly repent of your sins reconciled and at peace with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways. Draw near with faith. Take this holy sacrament for your encouragement and let us make our humble confession to Almighty God. We pray together. Almighty God, you led the wise men to worship the Lord Jesus. We confess that we have not followed the light of your word we have not searched for signs of your love in the world. We have failed to praise your son's birth and refused his peace on earth. We have expected little and hoped for less. Forgive our doubt and renew in us all fine desires that we may watch and wait once more, hear the glad story of our Saviour, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great promise has, um, has promised forgiveness of sins to all that truly turn to him with heartfelt repentance and true faith, be merciful to you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we come to this time of communion, we come recognising our need for his mercy, not because of anything we've done, but because of his kindness and grace. And so we pray together. We do not presume to come to this, your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in your tender mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there, by a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself. He instituted, and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue, a perpetual memory of that his precious death, until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation this bread and this wine. According to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of the death that he suffered, that we may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Today we'll have a couple of serving stations. I'll stand here and uh, Peter will stand here. So if you're in those two blocks, you kind of come to Peter. If you're over here, uh, come to me and uh, we'll hand uh, the bread to you. If you require gluten-free, do let us know. We've got some um, on the table here. Let us uh, share in the bread together.
So having shared in the Christian family meal, let us pray the Christian family prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We pray, giving thanks. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Our final song together speaks of that humble birth, but now his place enthroned in heaven with glory and splendour, giving glory to Emmanuel. God with us. Let's stand and sing together.
do be seated. The words we've just sung, he was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for a world's transgressions. Death defeated by Emmanuel. We have a saviour king who died in our place to save us. It's been a wonderful morning. We're here again next week, of course, continuing our journey through Advent. Do join us. We've got coffee now over at the Warwick Hall. Do remember the care we take over COVID. We also have, uh, if any of you would like or value a time of prayer, Sue and Charles are happy to pray with you. Do come uh, either speak to me or, or head over towards the Lady Chapel. That's the room kind of round there that you will find it. So that will be something that they'd be glad to do for you. Other than that, this is the end of our service. Let me close our time together with a final prayer. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.